Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. I was awoken by a large crack and heavy breathing. I looked about me. There was no candle or lantern to light the room, but the glow of faint moonlight crept past the cracks of the shuttered windows. It was enough to illuminate the yellow eyes that gazed at me from Bertrand's side of the bed. I leaped up, desperate to escape. The beast snarled quietly at me and jumped on the bed, standing where Bertrand had been lying. The wolf stayed where he was, watching me. Underneath him was the body of Bertrand. The neck had been snapped, the head nearly severed from the body. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, I share a story about my favorite cryptid of all time, the werewolf. It's an original story of fiction by Mark Lord, a tale told from a woman's perspective, a story of love, secrets, selfishness, betrayal, and a werewolf. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. I am the last survivor of the noble family of Trigoff. Before I left our family home for the last time and made my way to a convent, I found this book that records the famous deeds of our ancestors. The story I add here in these blank pages marks a sad end to a glorious history, yet I feel bound to write it before it's too late. There is talk of plague coming again through France from the south, and I am older and weaker now. I feel sure that this will be my last opportunity to tell of what happened. This is my confession. I was 17 in the summer of 1365. War and death had stalked the land of Brittany ever since I had been born. My father, the Lord of Trigoff, had been taken fighting in the Duke's Wars and my mother by plague before my earliest memories. The Duke was a generous but stern guardian. He benefited from the incomes of my family's estates, yet he also bore the responsibility of my upbringing. One day, he visited me as my maid Beatrice and I sat reading to each other verses from the Tales of Arthur's Knights. We had read little, though, as we would stop and compare the Knights of Arthur with those of the Duke's court, arguing over who was the most handsome or chivalrous, whether Bertrand to the Duke's court or Lancelot from Arthur's. "'It's time for you to marry,' said the Duke. My debt to your father is at end, and now you must make a good wife to one of my most faithful soldiers, Edward of England." He said little else and took his leave. He seemed happy to be rid of me, I thought. I wanted to run after him and protest against my fate, but Beatrice had already wrapped her arms around me. For a long time I stood there, my tears soaking through the shoulder of her dress. I was very scared. Edward was rarely at court and was not one of the chivalrous knights that Beatrice and I dreamt of. I had never seen him, but I had heard tales about him. My maids told me that he was a great and vicious killer, an English mercenary who had made a life for himself in France. They told stories of how he had slain Charles de Bois in the carnage of the Battle of Auray ripping his head off with his own hands. In my anxiety, I almost believed them. But when we met, 
his skin creased around his eyes with happiness, and he gently took my hand in both of his and held it with such care. He was more than twice my age, for an unfashionable full beard and his clothes, although expensive, needed attention. I remember noticing that one of the buttons on his rich doublet had been torn off, yet my heart warmed to him. Here was a man who would look after me. I had not seen my father's old castle for ten years. It lived in my memory as a place of looming towers and thick walls, a welcoming fire in the hall, plenty of hearty food, and the dense mystery of the forest spread out all around. The reality after years of neglect and the effects of war saddened me. The place was rampant with weeds. One of the walls had collapsed during the recent siege and the stone had been taken for building materials by local villagers. I was surprised to see how close the forest had grown to the walls. Some young trees brushed against the stonework. Edward planned to set his men to work to make the castle and the village something to be proud of again. I loved him for that. He told me that for years during his life as a soldier, he had dreamt of settling down with a castle and estate of his own. Now he had these, although it was a castle with broken walls and an estate with not enough peasants to till the land. The soldiers worked reluctantly, but with persistence while under Edward's supervision. The six English archers and two men-at-arms labored at clearing the weeds, cutting back the woods, and started on the long task of rebuilding the undermined wall. Robert, the old retainer Edward had appointed as constable of our castle, set to making lists of materials required for the renovation and guided the work at Edward's command. The first day at our new home was difficult. No tapestries adorned the walls to keep out the drafts, and food was scarce until Edward's new reeve, Stephen, organized supplies from the village. We didn't even have anything to sit on or eat from. That night I slept in the same bed as Edward for the first time, a simple straw mattress on the floor. I was scared of what would happen, but he gently held me as we both drifted into sleep tired from our first day in the castle. When I woke up on our makeshift bed early the next morning to find Edward gone, I was afraid. I got up and asked Beatrice to dress me. I walked out into the dim light of dawn looking for Edward and found only Robert warming himself with some steaming broth. He stood over the rubble of the broken wall, surveying the work to be done that day. He'll be gone for three days, milady, Robert told me. But where? I asked. I don't ask him, but don't worry. He'll come back after three days, I'll swear to you. The old boy never let us down yet. I was puzzled, but I resolved to stay calm and find out more when Edward returned. From what Robert said, it happened often and was nothing to be worried about. That night, as we were making ourselves ready for bed, Beatrice and I heard wolves howling in the woods. Beatrice clutched my arm. I shook my head. Don't fear. My father used to hunt these wolves in the forests. I am sure that Edward will do the same if they threaten his lands. I said this to calm her, but in truth I was anxious too. There had not been wolves here for many years. Were things so bad that they had returned? Over the next few weeks, I would sometimes think that I could hear the howling again, but I could not be sure. Edward returned to me late at night on the third day. I had kept a lamp lit beside my bed, a habit from childhood when I was scared of the dark, so I saw him come into our room. He looked well and smiled his kind, crease-eyed smile, but the doublet he wore was muddy and torn. A button hung off it still not mended from our wedding day. "'Let me have Beatrice mend your button tomorrow,' I said, not wishing to ask him about his absence. "'No, leave it to be,' he said as he sat on the bed next to me, gently stroking my hair. His words were firm, and I did not question further, but he was gentle and passionate with me that night. 
but the first time we made love. Each week Edward left me and each week after three days we were reunited again. At first I actually looked forward to these times. My feelings for Edward became fonder with absence and I looked forward to his return and the passion that he showed for me. Yet his unwillingness to tell me where he went nagged at my heart. It was so strange, so unlike what I had expected from marriage. I did not like him to keep secrets from me. The state of the castle and its estate also worried me. When Edward was there, all was progress and activity, but with him gone a state of lethargy descended. Work slowed or stopped, and I did not feel confident to take command on my own authority. Robert, who should have overseen the work with Edward absent, seemed to be the worst. When Edward was gone, all his customary purpose vanished. I would watch the old man often from a window as he polished his armor in the courtyard or went about some duty in the castle. His face would crease and he would scratch his chin. Something worried him. And I continued to worry every time my husband disappeared. Yet he always came back wearing the same doublet, the expensive one with the torn button. But of this he would never speak. Panic hit our household two months later. The castle was habitable at least, and some of the niceties of life had been restored, but it was in no fit state to receive a noble guest. Bertrand de la Saulon, son of the famous Hervé de la Saulon, who had fought at the Battle of the Thirty, had sent a page ahead with news that he would be with us that night. A trusted lieutenant of the Duke, he had been granted hunting rights in the wild woods east of Trigov. I remembered him as one of those dashing young men of the court who had provoked admiration from Beatrice and me when we were at court. Bertrand would expect hospitality of good quality from a newly raised man such as Edward. The soldiers busied themselves polishing their armor and weapons and cleaning their surcoats. The banners and badges wearing Edward's coat of arms were mended by Beatrice and other female servants, while I supervised the cleaning of a room for Bertrand, a bed and other furniture. Stephen, the reeve, emptied the village of its best food and sent a party of men into the woods to catch game for the coming days. Let's hope that he catches his own venison today. That would solve one of our headaches, said Edward, who spent the afternoon at leisure studying an old book of Breton folklore that he found in the village church. At dinner that night, a great feast was put on for the retinues of both Trigoff and Lasallen. Bertrand had brought with him a large retinue, several squires, pages, huntsmen, and their hounds and horses. Bertrand reminded me of the elegance I had known at the Duke's court. He was dressed in the latest fashions. Tight, party-colored hose and long, hanging tippets dropped from his sleeves almost to the floor. His slim, handsome features were not masked by a beard or long hair. I teased Beatrice that here was a potential suitor for her, and we laughed and blushed as we made our way to the hall that night. Talk was of politics and the court, and then proceeded to hunting, the reason for Bertrand's visit. He had heard of wolves in the area. I told him that in my childhood the area had been beset by wolves, but that none had been seen recently. They've all been driven off from these parts years ago, added Edward. Oh, I had heard that the reason there were so few peasants remaining was because they were scared of the wolves in the forest, said Bertrand. A lot of alarm is brought by such stories, said Edward. I think you can find the answer in simple avarice. The peasants hear stories of better wages and lower rents on the larger estates to the east. They are leaving to find work but know that if they ask for release from their duties, I would refuse it, so they simply leave. The next day, Edward and I joined Bertrand's hunting party. Edward soon became impatient with Bertrand's conversation, which revolved around the court intrigues of France and Brittany. My husband was hoping for a good ride that morning, but Bertrand led us at a leisurely pace through the sunny, autumnal forest. 
I was happy going slower as the woods were thick and I feared falling. Besides, it was interesting to hear about events of the noble and the famous. After a couple of hours, Edward spurred his horse back to the castle to look after some matters of estate business while Beatrice and I shared food with Bertrand and his squires. We laughed as the squires sang for us and Bertrand told jokes. Beatrice nudged me as we walked to our horses. The young knight could not keep his eyes from you, she said. We rode hard through the forest that afternoon, trying to keep up with Bertrand and his huntsmen. They found no wolves, but a stag was taken near the small river that separated the forest from the sparser woodland bordering the village. That evening, the castle was merry with feasting. The squires and pages celebrated Bertrand's hunting exploits, and even my husband joined in the jollity, telling tales of the wars of the Duke's succession. Robert told the greatest tale of all about when Edward struck the blow that brought Charles de Bois to the ground during the Battle of Auré. As Edward and his men became drunker on stories and wine, Bertrand's eyes and swift smile often strayed towards me. I was embarrassed. What if Edward saw? I did not yet know him well enough to guess whether he would be angry with jealousy or proud that other men desired what was his. Above all, I was anxious about Bertrand's attentions when I knew that Edward would be away from the castle from the next night. When Edward joined me in bed, I could smell the wine heavy on his breath. He was slurring his words, but happier and more talkative than I had ever seen him. Perhaps this was a good moment. My lord, before you take your rest, tell me, where do you go each week, away for three days and three nights? That I will not tell you or any man or woman, no matter how comely they are, he said, grinning at me and caressing my body with his large hands. I let him fondle and grope me as much as he wished that night, hoping that he would still tell me his secrets. But before long he slept noisily by my side, his arm lying over mine. Beatrice put her arm around me as I wept over my embroidery the next morning. She was a good companion and consoled me. I admitted my worries to her. I cannot bear this any longer. I must know where my husband goes every week. I wish he didn't leave me all the time. Milady, it has been known for men to have more than one woman. Perhaps he has a lover from before he married you and he goes to visit her. Such a possibility appalled me. How could he marry me for my estate and then treat me like that? I had to admit, though, that this was the likely explanation. We resolved to follow him that night to see at least in which direction he traveled and thereby guess at where he went. So as not to arouse suspicion, I told Edward that Beatrice and I had been invited to a meeting of women in the village. That was partly true. The miller's wife had been anxious to show us hospitality, so we did call there and supped with them. But by near midnight, we were on our way back to the castle, riding our horses like men. We had worn hose under our skirts. The night was cold, and we wrapped our cloaks and hoods well around us. I thanked God for the moon that night that allowed us to go without a lantern. We saw my husband riding fast out of the castle, wearing his accustomed doublet with the torn button, but no cloak or hat or hood to keep out the cold. Surely then he could not be traveling a long distance. He rode for a short time along the road north of Trigoff, but then went off the road into the woods to the right. We followed as best we could, but even though the woods were sparse here near the village, the going was difficult. In the end, the sound of his horse was our best indication and occasionally we could see movement ahead through the trees. Our way became more treacherous. We had to duck and dodge to avoid branches that loomed out of the darkness, and once or twice our horses whinnied in protest at being forced through the undergrowth. Eventually, we could not see or hear him any longer. What could be his destination if he is going in this direction? said Beatrice. 
There was no settlement this way, just the woods. Perhaps he heard or saw us and has been leading us awry. If that is the case, I am seeing a whole new deceitful side of my husband. We carried on until we met the track that led from the village to the river. One way was the village and the castle and a soft bed. In the other direction, the path led to a ford over the river and then the forest on the other side where Bertrand had spent the last two days chasing game but finding no wolves. Let us make one more throw of the dice. Perhaps my husband went towards the forest. In this strong moonlight, we might see some sign of his horse's hoofprints. We found more than that. His horse was tethered just off the path. It neighed a greeting when it heard our horses. The horse had been left on a long rope that let it walk down to drink at the river when it wished. In a wooden trough was enough fodder for three days at least. We left the horse as it was and returned to the castle. The next day, finding my husband gone, Bertrand invited me to hunt with him again. I feigned illness, but he insisted that if I was too ill to accompany him then he would stay at the castle, putting his retinue at my service. Our messages went back and forth through Beatrice. He sounded so charming and concerned about me. How much longer could I stay cooped up with such an insistent and handsome young man waiting upon me. I agreed to hunt with him, and we set out that afternoon into the wild woods. The air was cool and clear, and the ride was pleasant in his company. I forgot the worries I had regarding Edward. I would question him upon my return, but here was distraction enough. We were in pursuit of boar. Beatrice and I rode behind the main group who were in the last stages of the chase. We struggled to keep up but slowed our pace as the thickness of the woods increased, following the sounds of the hounds and the horn as best we could. An earth bank flanked us to the right and a wooded hill swept down to a hollow below. The bellow of a boar and the shouts of men carried on the air. The kill would soon be made. Beatrice glanced over, laughed, and said, "'Do you think the young knight will be successful in his hunt, madame?' "'It depends on how skillful he is and how long his quarry remains unguarded.' We both laughed. I'd not had as much fun with the intrigue of love since our days at the Duke's court. As I turned my head back to our way ahead, I saw it on the bank to our right. He must have been watching us for several minutes, and we had now approached to within only a few feet of it. I pulled back hard on the reins of my palfrey and heard Beatrice let out a quiet yelp of surprise. I dared not look over at her. My eyes were fixed by those yellow slits amongst a mass of dark gray fur. The wolf stood calmly watching me, not Beatrice. He was at head height to us. I'd seen dead wolves as a child, so I could tell that this was a large male. His stillness and intensity showed he was not scared of us, as most such animals are. I believed strongly and instinctively at that moment that he could only want to attack us. He nodded once and then again at me, turned and left, moving steadily over the ridge of the bank and away. Without a word, we hurried our horses to join the rest of the hunt. I did not need to feign illness for the next two days. The episode had left me deeply shocked and a fever set to work upon me. I swore Beatrice to secrecy. I did not want Bertrand and his huntsmen catching news of a wolf in the area. His messages were sweet and cheered me while I lay in bed. They caught many deer and boars, but no sight of wolves. I had no love for those sinister predators, and if you had asked me then why I felt protective of that large male wolf we saw, then I would not have been able to tell you. Two nights later, I was bored of my idleness and was recovering from my fever. My mind had been much occupied by what I would say to Edward upon his return. I decided to meet him near the river where he would no doubt collect his horse hidden in the woods. I got to the stream just as he was saddling his horse and about to mount. The moonlight was again strong, and we regarded each other for a moment from either side of the clearing before speaking. 
How goes the hunt, madame? I have been ill these past two days. I am worried about you. I need to know where you've been. I told you I will not tell anyone, not even you. How could you expect me to trust you if you act so mysteriously? I know your horse has been left here for the last three days. Are you fond of walking through the forest? I was close enough now for him to see my tears. He walked over to my horse and rested his hand on my leg. My secret does not threaten you or dishonor your person in any way. That is all you need to know. I disagree. Villagers speak, soldiers gossip. The servants no doubt think you visit your lover and scorn my charms. What have I done wrong? I know I'm young and inexperienced in keeping a man happy. I can only believe you have another woman, an old love from before. I have no one apart from you. He was angry now and turned, spitting fury, his lips snarling over his teeth. Please, just leave this subject and have trust in me and our vows. No, tell me or maybe I will start leaving you and not telling you what I do. Visiting young men such as Bertrand, is that what you mean? Tears flooded my cheeks and I swayed in my saddle. Edward caught me as I slipped from the horse and laid me gently on the soft grass, his arms around me, his intense eyes looking with concern into mine. I will tell you, I will tell you, I don't want you to suffer any more, he said. Edward told me that every week for three days, his form changed to that of a wolf of the forest and that he walked on all fours having discarded his clothing. At the end of three days, he would resume a man's form again, but only after coming into contact with the clothes in which the transformation had first occurred, a doublet with the torn button that must not be mended. I asked him how long he had suffered from this and how it began, but at that time he was unwilling to tell me more. I shook my head and told him that this was the strangest tale that I had ever heard. How could I believe him? I saw you he said. I was the wolf on the bank watching you and Beatrice. I heard you talking about the hunt and about the young man whose eye you have caught. I blushed and stammered and denied it. You could have got that from Beatrice, I said. How? I have been away. Look, if you really need more proof, I will show you how it works. The day is not yet done. I still have part of the wolf in me. If I take off my clothes now, I will turn." And so he did, his body stretching and snapping into the shape of a large, dark, gray wolf with thick fur sprouting out all over his body, the same wolf that I had seen three days ago. I was too frightened to move, so I let him lick my trembling hand with his rough tongue. His sharp fangs picked up his doublet and hose as if he were trying to clothe himself in them, and the transformation reversed the hair of his body withdrawing into him, the structure of his bones changing back to that of a man. We talked for hours that night before we returned to the castle. Edward was happy to share his secret, a terrible curse that he had not been able to confess before. His words came out easily as I prompted him with questions. He told me of how it first began as a curse from a dying monk. The monk had been a victim of war his abbey standing in the way of Edward's war band after refusing to let his men have food from the Order's estates. That had been nearly a year ago now, just after the Great Battle of Auré that had been the high point of Edward's career. Poor Edward. He told me everything. He told me where he went when he was a wolf, how he hunted down deer like any other predator. He had seen the peasants that had gone missing from the village accepting money from a man in the woods, money to go to another lord's estates, and yes, he had admitted to killing them for their betrayal. He did not meet my eye when I asked him what he had done with the bodies. I hid my shivering as best I could and showed sympathy with his dilemma. But I was planning worse treachery than these peasants. What would Edward's vengeance be? if he only knew. At last, with great hesitation, he told me where he hid his clothes, in an old foxhole under a dead tree deep in the woods. 
foolish, kind Edward. I betrayed him. Why? I wanted protection and a lord for Tregoff who would take care of me all the time. Bertrand was easy to seduce, and when I had him in my bed nearly a week later while Edward was absent, I eventually convinced him that my husband was a changeling, what the women of the village would call a bisclavre in their stories. A werewolf. He smiled as he looked me in the eyes. How ironic, he told me, that he had come to hunt wolves, but had instead hunted me, and now would take away the humanity of my husband. I laughed at his cleverness, but I cared more about my future safety than his jokes. I demanded that he ensure the clothes were taken immediately and all of them destroyed afterwards. The clothes were removed by Bertrand, and Edward did not return to the castle. There was great concern amongst Edward's men. Robert and Stephen organized search parties and Bertrand's men helped, but there was no sign. Some tracks a day old were seen near the stream, but no wolf. The search went on for weeks, and letters were sent to nearby villages, towns, and castles, but there was no word. After a time, I asked Bertrand to lend me some men to help with the castle. After a couple of months, I dismissed Robert and all of Edward's soldiers from my service, taking in Bertrand's instead. I consulted with a new priest I had hired for the parish. The church, under such circumstances, demanded a year before I could remarry. For his help, I gave him back the book my husband had taken. The priest was not interested. It was only a collection of fabulous tales, the stories written by Marie de France. I sometimes wonder, if Bertrand had not been such a favorite of the Duke's, might we have avoided our terrible fate? but that would be to deny the sins of our actions, perhaps, and the just punishment we received. A year had passed, and it was soon after my marriage to Bertrand that the Duke decided to visit us. Messengers from the Duke's retinue came to tell us that he would arrive later that afternoon after hunting in the wild woods to the east of Tregoff. We prepared. We had plenty of servants now. Bertrand had money and the estate was producing revenue as it once had thanks to his investments. We both dressed and met again in the hall to await our liege. The doublet that Bertrand wore was familiar. Then I realized it was Edward's, but now the button had been sewn back on. What an idiot he was! I drew near to him and spoke quietly. You were supposed to destroy that! Edward is gone, never to return. Why waste such good clothes? I was surprised at his fine taste when I saw what was hidden in that hole. Please, get rid of them after today. If ever he were to come back… Another messenger came from the Duke's party. It was Robert, Edward's old constable, who had fallen into the service of the Duke. A tough, professional soldier like him could always find work. We exchanged polite and subdued greetings. Robert's forehead creased and he scratched his chin. Something troubled and distracted him as he gave his message. The Duke has been further delayed. A most strange event happened during the hunt. Pray tell, said I. A wolf was caught, but not killed. The wolf did not run or try to fight when we cornered it. Instead, when the Duke approached, it lay on the ground, its head outstretched before it, with eyes lowered as if giving fealty to its master. A tame wolf? laughed Bertrand. Perhaps escape from some lord's menagerie. It can go in with our hunting dogs, but in its own pen. My lord, the duke wishes it to go in his own chamber with his hounds. He feels no danger from the animal, which is as peaceful as a saint. I will go at once to ensure troughs for food and water are taken to the duke's rooms, I said. I had to get out of there. Was Bertrand so stupid that he did not see what this meant? I watched in fear from a tower as the Duke's entourage entered the castle. Next to the Duke's horse trotted a dark, gray, male wolf, its yellow eyes darting this way and that, scanning the castle, looking for something or someone. I hurried down to greet the Duke with Bertrand, my new husband. As I reached the courtyard, I could hear shouts and snarling. 
Two of the Duke's men, Robert one of them, held the wolf back as it snarled and jerked to free itself of their grip. Bertrand stood a few feet away, his sword drawn. "'You shall not harm the animal,' declared the Duke. "'He is my companion and will be shown due hospitality. It is strange that he has reacted to you in this way.' "'He has good judgment, perhaps,' said Robert, who gripped the wolf tightly and spoke soft words to calm it. "'Or maybe he can smell the blood of his cousins on you, Bertrand.' said the Duke. You are a noted hunter of wolves, after all. Come, let this disturbance not tarnish our visit. We will make sure you and our wolf are kept separate. Yes, my liege, I am sorry. Bertrand sheathed his sword and knelt before his Duke. I kept to the edge of the courtyard, not wishing the wolf to see me. I would greet the Duke inside. That evening we showed the Duke our hospitality, feasting and good cheer prevailed. The wolf was not mentioned and had been kept away from the hall. I was asleep later that night in the bed I shared with Bertrand. I was awoken by a large crack and heavy breathing. I looked about me. There was no candle or lantern to light the room, but the glow of faint moonlight crept past the cracks of the shuttered windows. It was enough to illuminate the yellow eyes that gazed at me from Bertrand's side of the bed. I leaped up, desperate to escape. The beast snarled quietly at me and jumped on the bed, standing where Bertrand had been lying. A knock came at the door, and Beatrice's voice called out, "'My lord and lady, please may I enter? The Duke's wolf has gone missing!' "'Open the door,' I said, the shortness of my breath forcing my words out quickly. The door opened, and the light from Beatrice's candle and the lanterns in the corridor outside shone into our room. The wolf stayed where he was, watching me. Underneath him was the body of Bertrand. The neck had been snapped, the head nearly severed from the body. Beatrice's shriek was enough to goad the wolf into action. He jumped to the floor in front of me and growled and loped off around the room, smelling and scratching at cupboards with his paws turning to growl and bare his teeth at me as he struggled to open them. "'Fetch my lord's clothes, Beatrice. The doublet and hose that he wore tonight. Get them!' Beatrice looked on the verge of fainting, but the wolf was calmer now and stood patiently in the center of the room. Beatrice came back to the doorway, the clothes in her hands, glancing at the dead body of Bertrand and at the wolf. I watched the wolf, too, not certain what his next move would be but recounting my prayers under my breath in case. Behind me was a rack of Bertrand's weapons. I put my hand on the hilt of a short sword. The wolf approached Beatrice. Put the clothes on the floor in front of him, I told her, and now you may go. Move slowly away and then go. She left, the slap of her sandals hitting the stone hard as she ran. The wolf sniffed at the clothes and then turned towards me without picking them up. I drew the sword and raised it to strike at the wolf. Everything happened so quickly. In a moment, I had brought the sword down on the wolf, cutting his right forepaw almost in two as he came towards me, leaping at me and knocking me over. He yelped and scratched at my face. I had room to swing the sword again and brought the hilt down hard on his back. The wolf staggered away from me, hissing and snarling. I was dazed, and the cut on my face hurt badly. We looked at each other. I let the sword drop from my hand and fell to my knees. I have wronged you. You are right to seek to kill me. Take your justice upon me. I bowed my head, waiting, but nothing happened. I looked up and the wolf was gone, the doublet and hose as well. Beatrice and other servants revived me later and the Duke and his men came to help. The body of Bertrand was taken away to the chapel and the Duke vowed to hunt down the traitor wolf that had done this. It was nowhere to be found in the castle. I pleaded with him not to, but he would not listen. The next morning, armed men were ready in dawn's dim light with crossbows and hunting spears, horses and hounds. The woods would be searched thoroughly. I watched them as they gathered in the courtyard, the Duke at their head. My wounded cheek had been bound with cloth. The gates were opened by the castle guards and a hue and cry went up. 
the body of a man lay outside. Robert was the first to reach it and lifted the limp body in his arms. It was thin and raggedy, but clearly it was the body of Edward, his shaggy, dark gray hair and beard quite distinct. And the doublet and hose were those worn by Bertrand just the previous night, but with the button now torn from the doublet. If Robert or the Duke or anyone else noticed that detail, I do not know. If they did, they did not care to mention it. All thought of hunting the wolf was put from their minds. The man, Edward, was alive. Later that morning, I walked from the castle alone, dressed in the cloak of a servant and a heavy veil covering my face. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Bisclavre the Werewolf was written by Mark Lord, and I've placed a link to the book in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Matthew 7 verse 2, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And a final thought, if you want to know what's wrong with our nation, look first in the mirror. Adrian Rogers. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.